So our next speaker is Andrew Lamb from Field Ready. Uh, Andrew is the innovation lead on the global team for Field Ready, for, uh, which are a disaster relief organization and make heavy use of 3D printing, I believe in a lot of their activities, which they use to uh, make uh, the aid supplies for humanitarian aid in the field itself and thereby circumventing a lot of the issues that might be seen through supply chains. So I've known Andrew for a while now and it's a great pleasure to host you at this event. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and um, thanks to everyone for uh, uh, joining the conference today. And um, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, I'm going to show some photos first, um, just to set the scene. This first photograph is one that I took um, in September uh, 2015, a few months after the earthquakes, uh, the Nepal earthquakes, which um, were, were enormous and uh, affected hundreds of thousands of people and uh, Field Ready was just getting started. So really my first experiences with additive manufacturing in the disaster relief sector um, are sort of captured by this photo on the screen here. Um, we were traveling in that um, Land Rover to some of the IDP camps, the internally displaced people camps in um, uh, Sindhapalchek district, this town is, is called Bahabise, and we were, and we had some innovation funding um, where we were from the UK government, where we were trying to figure out how 3D printing could help in humanitarian response. And this is really where um, my uh, work with Field Ready and the, uh, the organization as a whole sort of took off. Um, because what we found was that, well, we we could be useful and um, the areas where we were useful, I'll talk about in a moment. But I am talking about responsibility um, and ethics today. And I just want to say that, um, you know, this behind every photo, there's always a story. And what we're printing here is a 3D printed um, pipe connector, the water pressure the water coming out of the pipe, the taps, the tap stands in this camp was very low. And that was because there was lots of leaky pipes that had been just sort of pushed together and taped together. And so we did better connections and we 3D printed these pipe fittings to give them a, a better connection. It was still in use six months later, which that that meant that the water flowed more quickly, people could fill their bottles more quickly, there wasn't so much queuing at the, the water points for drinking water. But it was probably the most expensive pipe fitting the world has ever seen. It was myself and my colleague Mark, um, who you can see in the centre of the picture there, uh, flying in from Nepal and for a couple of weeks, um, doing an assessment visit, hiring this Jeep, hiring a guide as well, my friend uh, Supravat, who's on the edge of the picture there, and driving uh, with a driver that we also hired um, to to this uh, remote uh, camp in this place that's been badly affected uh, to print a single water fitting. And then when we went around the corner to the hardware store, there was a hardware store, store full of water fittings and pipe welding machines, in fact, you didn't even need pipe, um, pipe fittings. And I learned pretty quickly, pretty early on, that actually the challenges of that Field Ready was going to be facing, of trying to transform the, aid, the way the aid sector works by locally making aid supplies rather than flying them in, was going to be one that was around procurement and around policies and around trying to make it easier um, for organizations that were implementing these systems to be able to buy locally made products. So I've spent quite a bit of time working on that in the sector as well. Now, a few other photos. Um, I'm going to show you some photos which are basically around these areas where I think um, additive manufacturing has its, has its greatest value in disaster relief, prototypes, repairs, customized parts and mass production. And uh, 
spare parts first. So we did an assessment in South Sudan to see how additive manufacturing could be helpful there. We partnered with Water for South Sudan and 3D printed a, um, a number of items that they needed for a drilling rig to, dr to drill wells. And some of it was really basic stuff, but really critical stuff that in one case, it was a, a cap for a um, water pump. When the water pump filled a bladder tank, which um, they used to then lubricate the well, the drilling rig as it, as it was drilling. And they take this pump to the local river and fill the bladder tank there. And every now and again, the pressure would pop this um, cap off the pump and fire it into the river. And for want of that cap, the entire drilling operation had to stop until somebody managed to find a replacement cap, sometimes from the nearest city, sometimes from Uganda. They couldn't do anything. They had to find another pump. They had to find another cap. So we 3D printed a new cap and we took the amazing design decision to put a little ring holder on the cap, on the handle, so that a piece of string could be used to tie it to the pump. So when it popped off, it didn't get lost in the river and the drilling can continue. So little design changes like that and improving things. A lot of design is up close in humanitarian relief, at least I believe it should be. It means going into the field, in this case, often in the rain, and open up, opening up your 3D printer and, and doing rapid prototyping with communities. Um, a lot of it is about creating models for larger scale production. So here we have Mr. Casey um, uh, on the left there, showing about 15 years worth of his own uh, iterations improving uh, a cook stove burner because he was fed up of having um, smoke in his house. And the designs became so complicated. This wasn't his business. This is just something he was doing on the side. The, the designs became so complicated. He was having to leave Nepal to travel to India every six months to try and get them to machine a new cook stove burner. And then one day he heard of this new technology called a 3D printer in Nepal. That we've been able to introduce into the innovation lab we were working in and he knocked on the door and he said could you make this mold for us and sure our local apprentice uh, turned it into a 3d model you can see the black model at the top there and underneath is a um, cast from an ancient uh, technique they have in the pool of metal casting sand casting so from a single 3d print 240,000 cook stoves have been made um, using a sand casting technique. Um, but in this case, this wasn't necessarily about us doing the design. We were servants to Mr. Casey to, for him for, to try and bring his designs, his increasingly complex designs to reality. Um, design training is really important. This is literally design teaching in South Sudan um, people how to do design for 3D printing. And the way that you approach that um, is very difficult in some contexts. The people that we've gathered together here for this training are people who work on animation because they're used to dealing with 3D models. So they make animations for like adverts on TV or something like that. Um, and we brought them together and thinking that, that we could take uh, an extra step there. But it's um, again, this is sort of early design stages rather than design for manufacture. Now, here's a great designer. His name is Michael Gatogo. He's in Kenya and he's been um, uh, working with uh, Medsos and Frontier recently designing all sorts of appropriate technologies uh, in the field. But part of what we're trying to do with design is to make sure that, quite frankly, he gets paid. He gets paid for his designs or he gets paid for selling his designs or, you know, the open hardware movement is is really important to me. It's really important to Field Ready. Everything we do is open, but we have to make sure that um, we are for local designers that we have a responsibility to make sure that we're not abusing their intellectual uh, property. That they that they're not that they have an ability to make a living out of the design. So some of the things he's come up with we haven't published as open hardware because he wants to license them and and sell them. In a, uh, sell those designs for distributed manufacturing in other ways. 
Um, design is often very up, up close, as I said, we have a, a number of responsibilities just in this picture. Um, my colleague George here is uh, talking uh, about products that are going to be made out of plastic with uh, vulnerable people. And these and he's, you know, engaging with the end user directly. Um, it's it's often the, the privilege to do these community visits. Uh, it's often very hard to do um, design when you're remote from uh, the place uh, where the you know the the people that you're designing for. I'm going to come on to that in a sec. But um, women are a vulnerable com community in many contexts, uh, but the young and the old, as in particular, um, need to be safeguarded. Um, so that's a it's a big part of the design process is not just how you engage people, but also the safeguarding systems and the responsibilities uh, you have around that. Uh, oh, this is the drilling rig. Uh, I'll skip that picture. Now, um, some of the things, uh, if I stop presenting for a sec, um, some of the things I want to um, get at are around this idea that you know the designers are over here and the the field in disaster relief is is often thousands and thousands of miles away and to some extent um you're designing for contexts that um are very different from your own certainly for me sat in london i'm often designing for contexts that are very very different to my own um and uh, so humanitarian makers are often very far away from uh, the designers are very far away from the people they're trying to assist. Um, we also have to recognize that the, um, and that's a big part of humanitarian engineering, I should, I should say. There's all sorts of things you learn about in humanitarian engineering courses now, didn't exist when I was a student, uh, which is about sort of issues of appropriateness and the ability to deal with um, uh, cultural differences and you know humility and listening and and, and, and uh, issues like that. Um, but there is another aspect of design, which is that it slows you down. And I used to, I still say at Field Ready, that the first thing our engineers should do, it is their responsibility as a humanitarian. The first thing they should do is check to see whether designs already exist for what they're trying to make. Don't reinvent the wheel. So do an open hardware search or something um, using one of these data standards that I've been pushing called the open know-how data standard. But the, um, uh, the reason is that if you're designing something, if, if my engineers in the field were designing something, they're not making things. They're spending their time on design rather than making. And if they're not making things, they're not helping people. So the more time we spend on the design, <laughs> on design and product development, the less time we're actually having a humanitarian impact. So the more we can outsource some of that design, and in one case, like with that pipe fitting, we even designed, a, designed an app which could parametrically <laughs> just design, redesign 3D models of, of pipe fittings so we could print them out. We said, you've got a pipe of this size and a pipe of that size, just print it for us, please. Um, so we, we, did, we did things like that, but we also tried to create a humanitarian making community. Um, and I'm going to talk about that code of practice in a moment. With the, um, I, I think there is an incredibly powerful uh, nexus of forces coming together with additive manufacturing and humanitarian relief. And that's um, because we have an ability to deal with the unexpected and really complex and dynamic environments with uh, additive manufacturing that you don't necessarily get from globalized supply chains where a needs assessment might be done um, and then very quickly go out of date. But it still takes six months or even you know six weeks, if you're lucky, to ship the product that's been made far away to a local community. I think it's more responsible because you're making locally, you're creating local jobs rather than bringing in and distributing products for free that then get distributed to local communities, therefore decimating local markets and local producers' ability to 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 sell their products and ability to recover. So 
Uh, but it also means that designing for additive manufacturing means that you can engage with the end user and it can be very human centered. And there are aspects you can bring in. Engineers Without Borders in the UK has a concept called uh, global responsibility of engineers. And this is the idea that you aren't just responsible as an engineer for the technical performance of what you are making. You are also responsible for the uh, contextual environment in which it works. So, you know, every new um, building is, should be regarded as an engineering failure unless it responds to issues of climate change, for example. It's one of the ideas of global responsibility. Uh, and the same can apply to uh, additive manufacturing because it can be distri distributed and decentralized. There are all sorts of other benefits, including reducing carbon emissions of long and international uh, supply chains. Um, and there were some questions before about the, the carbon benefits of local production versus international. I really heard in some of the feedback from the breakout groups, the sustainability questions. Um, I think it can really speak to some of those issues around humanitarian engineering. Um, but let me just, because this is, I have some academics here, and because I'm not an academic, I'm just going to whet your appetite with a couple of things that I think you should potentially go and look into. Because the, um, if I can share my screen again, the, um, the reason I'm so excited about it is that there is a this there is a nexus between um, complexity and um, uh, local design that can respond to that complexity. And some of the theoretical underpinnings for this, at least in my mind, the things that I learn, uh, one is uh, from uh, the Kenevin framework from David Snowden, from Dave Snowden. It says Dan Snowden on this copyright. I don't know who Dan is, his name's Dave Snowden. Um, and basically what the domain that all engineers and that all responsibility systems and professional accountability systems in the engineering uh, profession depend on are really these comp simple and complicated um, uh, uh, domains for a system. So, you know, a light switch, it's simple. It's a simple system. You do the same thing twice, you get the same result. The effect is obvious. So you just categorize it and you know you repeat it and copy and it's fine. Complicated. You know, you need something a little bit more. Um, you need expertise. You need to look into you need to, a little bit more analysis. So I would describe an airplane as being very complicated. It's a complicated system and it should never be a nonlinear system. You never no one wants a nonlinear airplane. You know, it, it has to be accountable down to the very last rivet. That is not the way the world works. To, to be able to linearize everything, we have all of these techniques in engineering, but in the disaster relief sector, we're talking about non-linear systems, about chaotic and complex scenarios where you have to sense what is going on and you have to respond in kind. And actually you have novel practice and emergent practice all the time. You do the same thing um, in the next village as you did in your pilot project and you get a completely different <laughs> uh, response because it's a complex system. It, it is different. So I often think about this as, Part of humanitarian engineering is, and part of design for additive manufacturing is that it allows us to deal with complexity and chaos um, much more effectively than we have ever been trained to do. But the burden of responsibility then shifts to the individual. It moves away from the profession. It moves away from a lot of the systems. It, and particularly when you're out in the field on in the IDP camps of Bahabise and in Nepal, my first picture there, it really is down to you as an individual, not your professional body in the UK or the US, in Canada. Um, really is down to you, to you as an individual as to whether your design is going to be effective. Um, the other uh, thing I would, uh, you know, the, um, academic area of study I'd, I'd suggest is the idea of uh, requisite variety and variety engineering. Variety engineering is a, it's, it's not a branch of engineering as such. It's just the expression used in complexity theory um, that, um, that, you know, it's about how you can uh, regulate uh, um, increasingly complex systems. 
And in fact, you know, this, whenever I'm facing a management decision <laughs> about how I respond with uh, to, you know, to a design question or to a, um, a humanitarian relief uh, project question, it, it, I, I'll think about this uh, variety engineering. What is it that I can do that will have the, the desired effect? And most of engineering has been about trying to attenuate variety rather than trying to amplify variety. And I think additive manufacturing can really help us to amplify variety and to empower everyone. Um, and that's something I really believe and something we're pushing for in, in Field Ready to try and have more people empowered to be able to respond. Um, and my last photo, although it isn't necessarily going to be my last slide, so don't get too excited, is about this guy, Ram, we hired him as an apprentice on that same assessment visit that I went to on, I showed you on my first slide um, when we were making the water fitting. And we took him on as an apprentice. He, he started um, a love of 3D printing at university in India. He was the first person in his family to go to uh, university. His, his parents were illiterate and chicken farmers and taxi drivers. And they sent uh, their eldest son uh, to study and he did very well, but he'd never seen a 3D printer. He'd never seen a 3D printed object, but he did his final year master's project on 3D printing. He is, he became an apprentice with, with Field Ready. We uh, trained him up. He was the one that worked with Mr. Casey and came up with the design of the cook stove burner. Here he's visiting clinics, rural clinics, making spare parts for oxygen pumps, um, things like that. He now has a business called Zena Technologies. Um, so we don't do 3D printing. Field Ready doesn't do 3D printing in Nepal anymore. We would contract his company because why would we displace a local business from their work? We hire him to come and uh, do 3D printing work for us. And we've also set up a fab lab in Nepal. Lots of other things have come out of that very expensive trip to Nepal, as I mentioned at the start. Um, but I, the, the last thing I want to show you, if I can switch my sharing, and I'll run through quickly. Is in code of ethics. How am I doing for time? You're all good. Don't worry about it. Great. So we had a community. Um, you're going to hear from uh, open source medical supplies in a moment. Uh, how can I put it? Open source medical supplies supplies was successful. <laughs> uh, the humanitarian making community wasn't really. It hasn't really grown, it hasn't really gone anywhere. Um, we launched it in, in 2015 um, to try and solve this question of having designers, a, a pool of designers that we could call upon to do 3D design work so we could concentrate on the manufacturing in the field. And actually that was very hard to do, it was incredibly hard to do. Um, when people were responding to the pandemic, it, it, it was in their own homes and in their own houses and it became a little bit easier. But also, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's easier to motivate, I think, people where, um, when it's affecting, when, when it's a global issue like a pandemic. We were trying to help people um, respond to small issues like a broken hospital bed in a, in a rural clinic in Nepal. And it was very hard to get the, con the information flowing through the humanitarian makers community. But what we found through that community very early on in consultation, we, we ran workshops at um, Fab Lab conferences and things like this, is that there absolutely needed to be a code of practice, a set of a code of ethics to define some of the responsibility of doing digital fabrication and of making more generally in emergencies. And uh, this is it. This is the, the result. There's five points. I'm going to walk through them. Um, accountability to affected. You can all see this, right? It's up on the screen. Yeah, I'm sorry. The PDF um, layout isn't particularly pretty, but here it is. Um, accountability to affected populations. Um, we have accountability systems in the UK, in my country, where um, we are held to account through our professional institutions and through our companies and through our teams. Um, and it's 
actually, you know, through those systems that we are uh, accountable to the people who live in the house that you designed, for example. Uh, you may never actually get to meet, talk to, um, understand the people that you're designing the house for. <laughs> um, in humanitarian engineering, humanitarian making, it really should be about um, being accountable as an individual to the people you're working for. That, And that's really the, the core of humanitarian work. Rather than being accountable to the donors, or even to your um, your own sense of um, uh, what the legal system should be, even if it isn't that. To go to some of the legal points that Ian was making, even even if even if you don't believe in the legal system, you're in a country <laughs> often where um, they have decided what the rules are, and you play by their rules. So it's sort of accountability to affected populations, and this is about um the end user being the primary source of knowledge um the the user of the product now that might be a medical professional or it might be someone who's lost their home but that's a really important part of i think design for additive manufacturing humanitarian work now the the next point is open equitable and collaborative and actually um, this contrasts quite strongly with some of what Ian was saying about the way that um, SMEs might need to work. Um, everything that we do, we think is uh, at field ready. It's very important that it's open source and that other people can copy it and build on it and replicate it. Um, equitable is often very difficult, um, uh, but that to, to, to marry that with open practices, and the example I was giving about Michael Cathogo and him needing to make money from design, uh, designs that he came up with. Um, and then collaborative, well, that, that that's actually, you know, a really important lesson for a lot of engineers anyway, because we sort of, <laughs> we, um, uh, it isn't necessarily a part of our DNA, not all the time that we should be collaborative in that sense. It's not necessarily how we're trained to work, um, we would rather sort of externalize all of these, you know, not have all of these meetings all the time and <laughs> and, and just making these constantly changing design design decisions. We'd rather just work on the technology and, and actually that isn't going to work in in humanitarian making. Um, so this question of how to be wrong in a responsible manner, that's an interesting expression that emerged from the consultations. Um, and to be open about it, you know, as I was at the start of my presentation today, the world's most expensive pipe fitting, I said, <laughs> you know, I was quite wrong that, you know, but I, I justify it to myself because it came to it, it you know, I I can sleep at night because it, it led to so many other things. But even so, um, if I had tried to sell that to uh, the local implementing people for the water system, I, I don't think it would have been a very good idea. We will not make weapons. That's quite an important thing to say. A lot of the technologies that the maker community use are dual, dual use, dual purpose. So they could be used to make weapons. And I think we have to um, make sure that we always know what's going on with the machines that we introduce, that we're responsible for, and that they don't ever inflict um, harm on others, either because they're weapons or because of things that have been badly made. And that's where we come on to striving to be standard bearers. OK, As, and that's about, you know, some of the, you know, if you're making medical devices, make sure you aim for some of the certifications and so on that you're you're looking for. And then the last one was changing the system because, uh, you know, having a radical spirit within the community that you can actually change the way the, the systems work. I'm going to bring it to an end there because I'm I've been talking a lot and I lost my connection. But um, I, I hope you got a sense of what I was trying to say about humanitarian engineering ethics and emergencies. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. And I think yeah, uh, even with the disruption, we got everything there, so not to worry at all. And I'm actually quite surprised that this is the first occasion this has happened. So we're doing quite well. To we've only had one incident. Well, I'm. Uh, I'm far from home, and I'm I'm using a, a hotspot on my uh, <laughs> on my Roman <laughs> data package thing. So I'm glad it's worked at all, to be honest. Excellent. 
Um, well, hopefully it'll stay there while we have a few questions. So I've seen a couple that have entered into the chat. Um, there's a couple of messages of praise for you, Andrew. You are now uh, somebody's hero, which you'll be happy to know, uh, Rob's. Wow. Um, Thank you. <laughs> some, we do have a question from Constantine about uh, the open know-how uh, data standard. I don't yeah. know if you could elaborate a little bit more on that for us, please. Sure. Um, the It's still an emerging standard. Um, the, but the idea is to make it easy to um, find hardware documentation online. So at the moment, it's a discoverability standard. And the idea is that for every design that gets published, uh, there will be an open know-how manifest um, that will essentially make it easier to search for hardware designs online. We're actually also based on this building a search engine at the moment. The effect of this is that you do not have to trawl 70 odd different maker platforms and, and people's personal websites or in my case NGOs personal own websites to be able to find um, hardware designs. And as, as Joshua has, has noted, noted that there are platforms like Appropedia that will automatically generate manifests for you. But you can explore openknowhow.org and it's it really is about trying to make it easier to be able to search for good quality hardware designs across the many, many platforms where you could publish. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'll open it up to the wider audience if there's any questions. If not, I might exercise some of my privileges as uh, the uh, host. So um, one thing that was really great to see was how you enabled um, the the fellow over in Nepal to be able yeah. to take control of the design process and to to really be the master of their own destiny, which was something that dropped out of the Solomon Islands project that we did was this kind of missing dimension that we identified really quite quickly. Um, I wondered if you could um, perhaps discuss some of the challenges you have with translation of that kind of know-how and both on the CAD front and the hardware side of things. Because again, in I'd imagine in some instances you're dealing with communities where education levels might be quite low. And so that could be a challenge to, to kind of impart that wisdom on the indigenous population. Yeah. Um... My our approach to this was it, OK, so one of the issues that, that, that came up, I'll give you the example first and then I'll talk about mm -hmm. the, the approach. The, there is a very different attitude in many countries, and I'm not I'm trying not to be judgmental here <laughs> and it's hard um, to what uh, good and bad is in the sense that mm -hmm. a good, a well made a successful 3D print <laughs> versus uh, a bad 3D print hmm. is is often defined. I mean, there is a. I remember a case in in Haiti where it's like, well, no, it must. The the print the computer's done it, so this must be right. Like, hmm. even though you could see that the 3D printer had slipped, like, yeah. well, if this is the way it was supposed to be. It must be right because that because that's the way the computer did it, and that's you know. So there's a sense of like, and the other thing about what good quality engineering is that in, in a place like Haiti, they just weren't used to what good quality engineering feels like and looks like. So mm -hmm. literally there was a, a light switch on the wall and a 3D printer on the table below and the, and the light switch on the wall had a panel missing. So if you weren't, it was just a switch, but if you weren't looking, you could press the contacts and electrocute yourself. Honestly, light switch here, 3D printer on the table below. Come on, people, <laughs> Let, let's identify this as a problem and this is a solution. Sure. And the connections just weren't made because it was very much about um, not necessarily taking the initiative. Uh, it, it was more about if they haven't done it before, they don't know it can be done. Mm -hmm. And and that's really, that, that was something that we had. Our approach to this was was basically to try and get into design thinking and you know, we we do exercises with Lego and with cardboard and things like that, and just and create an environment where where people can create rather than just consume downloaded designs. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent! Yeah, that's good. It's a good keen insight. Yeah. 
Do we have any more questions while Andrew's with us here? So Constantine's oh. asking about the most absurd example from the field. Um, okay. I think. Um, it's absurd is uh, yeah, it's throwing me off a little bit. I think one of the things that we never really expected um, was to to see um, uh, things like straw holders and um, you know little three D printed clips um, that could go into drinking bottles for people with disabilities to 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 drink their water, being so incredibly popular. And actually, the the it it's the absurdity is that it was absurd to us that we didn't we didn't recognise this as something before. Like we, it's you know, using a straw uh, when you can't use your hands <laughs> is it, not something I'm an expert in. And so I just you know it it was amazingly popular in Fiji when we started printing these things for a, a school with disabilities. The other thing is was an occasion where we didn't need to make anything. We just borrowed some hardware materials from the local hardware store. Borrowed. We didn't even pay for it, and got some plywood and some battens and some concrete blocks, and we made beds. And well, they weren't really beds. They were enormous great big long things because we weren't we weren't going to cut cut any of the wood and we wanted to put a give it back to the hardware store at the end of the um when the when the collective center got closed down so the um the thing about that was that we had to really recognize that even though everyone was saying what we need is beds that isn't what they wanted what they wanted was not to sleep on the floor and the bed is a, a bed is a solution to not sleeping on the floor, and we would we spent a long time trying to design a solution that met the specification of a bed. And when we changed our mindset to let's have a, a specification of let's not sleep on the floor, then we started borrowing hardware materials from from the store of these sheets of plywood and planks and things, and, and, and we made uh, sixty beds in four hours. So it was much much quicker. We didn't drill, we didn't cut. Everything went back to the store afterwards. Um, I think that those are some pretty good examples. Uh, how long does it take to, between first exposure to technologies and people seeing the potential solutions? I think I think it could. In some cases, it's um, uh, it's instantaneous. It's intuitive. Um, but I would to really get to the a level of design which we you know we can contract with and we can hire people with I think a, a one-year apprenticeship would make a lot of sense and uh, I'd be nervous about hiring people with less experience than that um, because as has been mentioned in the conference today people walk into this thinking 3d printing is easy and it isn't <laughs> so, thanks excellent thank you for that response unfortunately in the interest of time because it is uh, moving on I'll, I'll draw that to a close there but thank you so much Andrew for coming and speaking with us and sharing your insights that you've had with Field Ready they've been really enlightening and quite inspiring as well at the same time so thank you thanks guys <laughs>